OK, so I said this week to the Treasurer when he came through in the budget lockup of the $22.7 billion being committed um, over the next 10 years, I said, how much is that actually cash and how much is off the balance sheet? And he made the very candid observation that a lot of it is support, like, say, for example, the $2 tax break, uh, $2 per kilo tax break on green hydrogen. Now, there's not been a kilo of green hydrogen yet produced in Australia, so there's actually no money having to be committed by the government. Are they really just simply markers for business to be able to try and build their business cases around as distinct from genuine amounts of money that might otherwise be committed by the federal government? Well, bear in mind there's two things, and similar to something I touched on earlier, Ross. You know, you've got other governments that are leaning in because they recognise they've got to reduce emissions, but they also appreciate that if they do it in a particularly good way, it'll create industry and job opportunity and so they are extending that type of government backing to make that uh, a reality and they're having to lean in on that right and in amounts that uh, will sound pretty big to people but are important to be able to drive economies of scale improve the efficiency of the technology and get it widely adopted by industry and in terms of hydrogen the big thing about hydrogen that doesn't get appreciated is it'll be an important part of the transition to what's known as green metals. That is, that it'll, uh, instead of relying on, uh, in terms of ores and burning them and the, the, the carbon footprint that comes out of steel production at the moment, we can do it in a much cleaner way. And so most steel makers are looking at hydrogen to make the transition from high emissions to lower. Uh, and getting this right is going to be important. And governments have always... The thing is, most things that we take advantage of today, Ross, have not just come out of um, simply uh, private investment. They've had their gestation through investments made by governments through universities and research, backing through R&D incentives to be able to commercialise and scale and then be taken over by the private sector. It's been an interplay between government investment and private uh, on ingenuity and backing and capital and being able to merge that together. So some of it, yeah, is a marker yep. to let people know that, that that investment can be backed by that to shave off some of the price while things get cheaper. Um, it's part of the reason why we've got a RET. It's part of the reason why we have a Clean Energy Finance Corporation. It's part of the reason why we've got an arena, and that is to shave the edge off uh, things that prevent private investment, but to bring them together to be able to drive development. OK, so a final one for you. The future made in Australia. But a lot of business is now saying, what about the business that is essential, that is based here and now? And one essential business I'll give you is Quenos, which takes gas and turns it into yeah. polyethylene, which is all of our plastics. Now, it might be a fairly dirty industry, but it's an essential industry if we are to have yeah. a level of self-sufficiency and sustainability. Where is the government support for those types of businesses, for companies that, say, for example, make fertiliser, um, say, and I'll give you the good example of that, is Orica, uh, the biggest explosives company in the world, a user of gas. Where does the government lean in to come Companies which do create essential industries for Australia right now. Okay, let me take, just go straight to the Quenos issue. Um, uh, two things. One is obviously for firms like Quenos, and I very much respect the role they play as a polymer resin manufacturer in the plastic sector. Yeah, there are a lot of companies that are dependent on Quenos's product, and uh, one of the reasons why we intervened in gas, and you heard me speak up for ages about uh, my deep concerns about where gas prices uh, and spot prices in particular were going and what was happening with contracts. And I make no apologies that I was pretty sharp and pointed uh, about the way that occurred um, back in 2022. With our interventions were designed to start calming that market and shielding manufacturers from the worst of energy price rises, particularly when it related to gas pricing. So we've been able to make some decisions there. Now, Quenos's investors, apart from us trying to um, shield people or manufacturers like Quenos from that, I mean, Quenos's investors make decisions about whether or not they'll stay or go. Uh, and in this case, they've made a decision that they want to put their money elsewhere uh, and in different, different ways. And, you know, people, I mean, I can't compel um, in a 
uh, market system, I can't tell people, no, you must ret retain your investment oh, here I and get do that, this. I get that, but they were Chinese XYZ. owners, right? I get that, but they were Chinese owners. Cause, so, cause, you know, who knows strategically whether it's not in China's interest for us not to be able to be self-sufficient in that product? Well, I'd be very... Well, I mean, obviously, you can make that, that statement, but government ministers, uh, I think, have to be very careful about just lurching in and, and making those type of, of statements. Uh, but the reality is, for me to make that direct intervention uh, in the way that is implied in your question, I'm not saying that you're, you're saying it that way, um, would uh, mean that we'd be operating in a different type of economy. So, and I don't think that's what we're arguing, right? So people will make their calls, but fundamentally for manufacturers across the board, I've spoken up very strongly that gas companies need to be mindful of their pricing and we don't want them to be making profit at the expense, regardless of the impact they have on the broader economy. And that's why we've had to make some interventions in the way that we've done. We've also brought in a mandatory code of conduct for wholesalers so they uh, actually play nice and behave better and negotiate uh, in a much fairer way when they're securing contracts with their customers, many of which are large manufacturers. And uh, if we do need to make further changes, then we will always keep tabs on that and we'll listen to industry on it and we'll make changes if we have to. Ed Husick, always good to have you on the program. We'll do it again very shortly. Many thanks for your time. Good on you, Ross. Thank you.